calls to sit down. I had the great good fortune of working with Joan Brown for several years at CBS News. Joan was a woman of great intelligence, unbounded decency, and absolute journalistic integrity. It is all the other things that each year we present an award for excellence in Washington reporting in Joan's name. If you were to make that presentation to someone else who works with Joan, someone who is highly respected throughout our business. George Holmes, who has recently returned to Washington after finding retirement in New Hampshire, Miss Liberty, works at CBS News for more than 40 years. For 15 years, he was moderator of Face to Face. For several of those years, Joan Rowe was the associate producer, then executive producer of that project. Who better to present the Joan Rowe Regional Home Award than a special man who worked closely with and knew well that first time in New and a friend of mine, and I protested. Joe and I said, that's not the right way to be working at this thing. We're supposed to be impartial. She glared at me for a moment, and then she sighed. All right, you're absolutely right, she said. Just get some news out of the bastard. The winners of the 1995 Barone Award did an elegant job of getting some news out. That's right, incidentally, winners in the plural. For the first time, our judges decided that two of the entrants were so hard on the heels of the winner that they gave runner-up status for the first time to CNN's correspondent Candy Crowley and producer Mike Roselli. Since this is something new, we don't have any physical award for them to come up here and receive, but I'd like to tell you some of what the judges said about their coverage of some key Senate races. Quote, they demonstrated their ability to bring the flavor of the places and events to the viewer. You felt you were there. And in another remark, meaningful to most of us in this business, that they did their work under incredible time pressures makes it all the more special. Candy and Mike, please stand so we can applaud you. Okay. Well, as you can see, Mike is here, but Candy is not. Now, the actual winner of the Joan Shorenstein Barone Award for Excellence in Washington-based national affairs public policy reporting. The winner, a person of whom one judge said, took the story of the day and put it into a sophisticated perspective that showed a sense of history, insight, and balance. A second judge praised the work as making wonderful use of sound, not only from the principals, but also from the people affected by an event. And the third judge praised the wonderfully clean writing which put events into a seldom achieved context. The subject of all this praise, ladies and gentlemen, the winner of the Joan Shorenstein Barone Award is 
Elizabeth Arnold of National Public Radio. amazed and thank you very much um, I appreciate this and I'm very honored and uh, thank you to all of you and to National Public Radio and again I have nothing to say because I'm completely surprised by this <laughs> and to Candy and Michael uh, you did a terrific job and you're right there with me so thank you I think for once we were able to keep a secret. <laughs> Thank you, George, and our thanks, too, to the uh, Joan Shorenstein Barone Award judges, who were Jackie Judd of ABC News, Keenan Block of McNeil Air, and out in the audience somewhere, George Snyder of King Broadcasting. And we want also to welcome Joan's father, Walter Shorenstein, uh, who is here tonight, and we're delighted that he could join us this evening. This is about as simple an introduction as you could possibly find. It's my pleasure to introduce the President of the, uh, President of the United States, Mr. President. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you. Thank you very much. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, Bill. I can't think of anything better for a politician than to be introduced by a guy named Headline. Hillary and I are delighted to be here. I am told that this is by far the largest group of radio and television correspondents ever assembled this far from a Los Angeles courtroom. I don't know, you know, the press is always asking me if I'm watching the OJ trial, and Mike McCurry always has to say, oh, he's so busy with affairs, of, of course I watch it. <laughs> and the other day, I, I was watching it, and the, the camera zoomed in to Judge Ito's computer monitor. You've seen that, haven't you? There was an email message on it from Wolf Blitzer begging for a recess. <laughs> I, uh, you know, every year when I come here, even though I've only been here a couple of years, I recognize more and more faces, and now I'm getting so good at it I can tell when people are missing. This year, thanks to Mr. Army and others, PBS couldn't afford a ticket for both McNeil and Lehrer. Uh, the, uh, the, uh, I know that because Louis Rukeyser told me that when he checked my coat when I came in. <laughs> I, uh, I'm trying to figure out what's going on here. I guess the rest of you are too. I, I have puzzled over this Republican assault on affirmative action. You know, the Republicans started affirmative action under Mr. Nixon. I think the reason that they don't like it anymore is because the Democrats are now a minority. Uh, I, uh, I have decided to adopt their position on another important issue, term limits. I'll settle for two. You know, this campaign is amazing. It's gotten so heated up. 
that uh, <clears throat> when I called L.L. L. Bean last week, they told me they're back ordered on red flannel shirts for several months. <laughs> because I'm president, they promised to send me mine by June. <laughs> Look, in, in spite of this campaign, I, I want to tell you that I am going to keep doing the job the American people elected me to do. I'm going to let the rest just take care of itself. I'm still working on Saturdays. I mean, I was working on Saturday a couple of weeks ago, trying to do the things that a president really doesn't have time for during the week. I was reinventing my filing system, according to Gore, <laughs> adding up my own frequent flyer miles on Air Force One. I even did a little spackling in the Roosevelt Room. And I noticed, I looked outside, and there was the uh, vice president mulching the environment in the Rose Garden. <laughs> so I invited him in, and we were there we were all alone on a Saturday, a beautiful Saturday, and we got into this deep discussion about the new ideas we needed for reinventing government. I said, you know, we got to have exciting ideas, breakthrough ideas, third wave ideas. And so we began to think right off the bat, in this drive to downsize government, we discovered that there was a useless extra C in the FCC, and we got rid of it right away. <laughs> then we ask ourselves, in our lust for consolidation, do we really need North and South Dakota? <laughs> but when we thought of how frugal and inexpensive they were, and when we remembered the votes on the balanced budget amendment, we said, yes, we do. <laughs> Furthermore, for economy's sake, uh, we intend to propose a central Dakota to this Congress. <laughs> Vice President, ever the humble public servant, suggested that this year we could save money by doing away with the White House Christmas tree. We could just hang the ornaments on him. Now, he approved that joke, I want you to know. <laughs> then Leon Panetta came in, and we had, finally at last, three people in the same room in the White House who were over 45. <laughs> and we decided that we could consolidate our staff further by replacing 15 30-year-olds with five 90-year-olds. <laughs> Then the rest of the staff came in. They all trooped in, and we were talking about new ideas, these exciting breakthrough ideas. We discussed an opportunity for entrepreneurship in dealing with the deficit, which I know the Republicans will agree with. Uh, next week, I intend to propose that we put the President and the Congress on commissions. Then we'll turn a profit in no time. All your programs will be gone, but we'll do well. This is a serious proposal. Instead of getting rid of all these domestic observances that we have, all these domestic programs, why don't we do what all the athletic events are doing, you know, like the Mobile Cotton Bowl? Let's get corporate sponsorships for government. Like we could make February 12th Lincoln Mercury's birthday. <laughs> and you all tell me all the time I, I need to do better marketing. So we have a new idea. We, we're going to put Ed McMahon's picture on the IRS refund checks. <laughs> Just imagine when you get your envelope from the Treasury Department up in the corner, it says, you may already be a winner. <laughs> Two other ideas we had. We, somebody in one of these meetings, you know, even the Democrats go too far sometimes on downsizing government. One of them said we ought to turn the Pentagon into a triangle, and I said, no, I am going to hold the line with a veto threat for a rhombus. <laughs> then it was suggested that the greatest consolidation we could do is to consolidate the Bureau of Indian Affairs and the Joint Chiefs of Staff into the Joint Chiefs. <laughs> you know, I was afraid that was politically incorrect, but it got by, it got by. <laughs> Now, this is the most important thing I'm going to say tonight. I came here to offer a way to make peace with our Republican friends on this heated school lunch issue. Al Gore and I have discovered a reinventing government way 
Mr. Army, to get around this terrible rhetoric we've been flinging at you on school lunches. We have a way to save money through streamlining that does not require us to deprive our children of food. Instead of cutting food, we're going to cut the cutlery. And here's how. With a spork. <laughs> now, you know, I don't know how many of you know that. I've been eating off these things for years. I never knew they were called sporks. <laughs> but that's what they are. This is the symbol of my administration. <laughs> this is a cross between a spoon and a fork. No more false choice between the left utensil and the right utensil. <laughs> this is not an ideological choice. This is a choice in the middle and a choice for the future. This is a big new idea, the spork. <laughs> Now, when we get by that, I'm going to reach a breakthrough agreement with Senator Dole to cut down on the commuting cost of Congress by moving the Senate sessions to New Hampshire. <laughs> and, I'm hoping even to get Senator Graham's vote for that. Also, we decided to do something for that group of constituents that's supposed to be so alienated from the Democratic Party, we want to combine the Bureau of Alcohol, Tobacco, and Firearms with both the Bureau of Fisheries and the Interstate Trucking Commission. We're going to call it the Department of Guys. <laughs> And if you don't like it, there ain't a place for you in the Democratic Party anymore. <laughs> Finally, I have decided to support the most controversial Republican idea in the legal reform area, loser pays. But only if we tie it to campaign finance reform and make it retroactive to 1992. <laughs> Now, that was what Al Gore and I did on just another Saturday afternoon at the White House. So even though all the actions were the Republicans on the Hill, I just wanted you to know you're still getting your money's worth out of us. Shows you the kind of great thinking you get out of a bunch of highly motivated people who don't get enough sleep at night. Well, I could go on like this forever, but you know that, don't you? <laughs> uh, uh, the, uh, Let me say, uh, for 51 years, all of you have gotten together and invited others to join you in celebrating the best of the electronic media. And while the times change and the rules change and the practices change, I really believe that most of us in this room, like the people who came here 51 years ago, want what's best for our country and do what we do in the hope that we're doing it well enough to advance the interests of the United States and to keep the American dream alive. This is an unusual and difficult time for all of us because of all the challenges out there in the country today. But it's a very, very exciting time, not only to be covering events in Washington, but to be a part of it. I thank you for the work you do, and I thank you for having us here tonight. I do want to say that I'm a little apprehensive. The next speaker, Bill Maher, has a TV show named Politically Incorrect. Out of respect for him, I've tried not to be politically incorrect tonight. Out of respect for me, I hope he won't try to be presidential tonight. <laughs> Thank you all, and good night.
Mr. President, thank you very, very much, and thank you for being here with us tonight. Well, this has been a, uh, a year of change and a time of change. And one aspect of that time of change that has affected all of us in this room is the emergence of cable. CNN and A&E and Discovery and Court TV and C-SPAN and CNBC, along with MTV and VH1, TNT, and TBS, and the Movie Channel, and ESPN, and USA, and many others have been in the forefront of that change. But cable is more than news and documentaries, and music, and movies, and sports, and even infomercials. The art of comedy flourishes on cable nowhere more than on the Comedy Channel. One of Comedy Channel's most popular entertainers is Bill Maher star of Politically Incorrect. We are delighted that he is here with us tonight. Here's Bill Maher. Thank you, Bill. Thank you. Thank you, Bill. How about that Bill Clinton? Funny young guy, isn't he? He's going to be working in Bethesda, open mic nights. Well, it's a tremendous thrill, and uh, Honored to be here uh, in the same room with probably the most watched man in the world. Cato Kalin is here, ladies and gentlemen. <laughs> That's true, by the way. But uh, besides the great honor of getting to meet the president and to talk to all of you, I got some very good news. Apparently, I'm next in line to head up the CIA. But. Uh, just getting my cards. <laughs> now, I, uh, I did want to make a few points. I, I look out on the room, and I, I see so many politicians. I, I feel a little like a mosquito at a nudist colony. Where do I begin? But uh, I, I noticed listening to conversations, it's very much like show business. In fact, I heard two senators talking before, and one was saying to the other, you're lying to me. The other one said, OK, but hear me out. <laughs> it's great to be in the room with so many uh, important people, the president, the speaker. Uh, I don't know if Bob Dole is here. I read in the news that yesterday he visited a, uh, a children's hospital apparently to soften up his image a little bit. And he said to one little sick boy, I hope you get better and buck up and you'll pull through. And then he said to a, a little seven-year-old girl in a body cast, stop lying about my record. <laughs> but <laughs> anybody from Chicago here? I know uh, the new, everybody is watching to see if Michael Jordan, yeah? We'll come back. Everybody in that city of Chicago is waiting and happy that Michael is probably going to make a return, except, of course, for the guy on the Bulls who plays Michael's position. That's kind of the way Bob Dole and Phil Graham feel about Colin Powell. See, he's going to take their position. All right, I, I guess I need a presidential pardon for that remark. But uh, no, we love to come here to Washington when I bring the show down here. And uh, they were so nice to us this time. We came into town and uh, got a 21-gun salute. And then I realized I was just passing the White House. <laughs> uh, <laughs> no, it's amazing what goes on. I mean, a plane landed on the White House lawn. I didn't even know US Air flew to Washington. <laughs> and the weird part is the luggage went to the Lincoln Memorial. But um, now I went over to the, uh, the Air and Space Museum the last time I was here. Nothing but a bunch of empty rooms. I mean, <laughs> Air and Space. It was. It's a strange town, Washington. It, it, it is simultaneously the seat of our government and the crime capital of the country. Not, not that those are really two different things. But uh, no, 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 Marion Barry here is, has resolved to take drugs off the street <laughs> one gram at a time. But um, <laughs> hey, 
Hey, New York is the city that never sleeps. Washington has the mayor that never sleeps. It just... Oh, well, you'll get over it. It's nice to look out in this room and see uh, so many friends, people that uh, we've had on my show, Politically Incorrect, people we've gotten to know down here. Uh, George Stephanopoulos is here. I hear that he and uh, James Carville just signed to do War Room 2. They're back and they're sleazier than ever. It's an amazing... <laughs> Susan Molinari is here. She's been on our show. Cokie Roberts, Nita Totenberg. Bill Headline, thank you very much. I also wanted to mention him. I did not know Bill before this. I uh, went into my office one day a few weeks ago and there was a, a message and it said, uh, CNN, Bill Headline. And I thought, oh, that receptionist, she's, she's been inhaling again. I thought it must be, you know, Bill, Headline News or something. But I called up, I said, is there a guy named Bill who works? They said, yeah, Bill Headline. Do you want to speak to him? I said, no, I'd rather speak to Eddie Op-Ed Page. <laughs> is Bob Caption around? Who else? Arianna Huffington, who was uh, one of the original guests on my show before she was a household name and continues to come on, and I really appreciate that. And uh, thank you, Arianna. <laughs> <laughs> Now, I feel for, uh, she and her husband spent $27 million in the Senate race out there in California. Boy, I, I felt like a schmuck when I blew eight bucks on Stargate. <laughs> uh, I don't know if Georgette Mossbacher is here. She's a frequent guest on our show. I know she's a, a Washington socialite. In fact, I, I saw her uh, last time I was here in Washington on the street in a a homeless guy came up to Georgette and said, please, I haven't eaten in five days. She said, I wish I had your willpower. <laughs> There's... <laughs> Are you writing these down because, you know, I paid good money for these, sir. Um, there's a lot of people probably who are here or come to these events in Washington who I would love to get on. Uh, Lee Iacocco, I know he had a rough year. His wife left him. And not just that, she, she left him for a smaller, more compact Japanese man. And uh, James Carville, Mary Madeline, uh, I did her show down here. I know she's down here. And, and she and James Carville are, are having a baby. Did you hear about that? Isn't that lovely? Yeah. They say they don't care whether it's a Democrat or a Republican as long as it's a lying, conniving little bastard. <laughs> and Mr. Cato Kalin is here, ladies and gentlemen, the biggest star in the country right now. Yeah, no, he's had a rough time. They accused him of a lot of stuff. Last week he went on uh, hard copy and he said, I don't do drugs, I don't get drugs, I don't get women for men. Boy, he does a lot less than we thought. <laughs> but, um, hey, President Bush picked Dan Quayle, stranger things could happen. They need a pretty boy to make him look smart, you're right there. What did, what did I say there? I don't even know. But no, it's true. The race for president is, uh, is truly on. And, you know, everybody makes fun and criticizes, but it seems like everybody wants to be president because here in Washington, it's like sort of like being a sled dog. If you're not the lead dog, the view never changes. <laughs> uh, I know we have a lot of candidates, uh, perhaps, here in the room. Uh, Phil Graham, bad news for film. Dickie Flats is supporting Bob Dole this year. And <laughs> no, Dole is ahead in all the polls. In fact, he was so glad about it, he scheduled a smile for early next week. So <laughs> no, Phil Graham is running. His slogan is <laughs> Graham, for people who don't think Bob Dole is mean enough. <laughs> I 
Yeah, Bob Dole, he's trying to look more presidential. He, you know, he was with Gerald Ford last week. He asked him, he said, President Ford, what do I do to look more presidential? And Ford said, fall down a lot of stairs. <laughs> now, Phil Graham, he's creeping up uh, in the polls. And uh, of course, he used to be a Democrat. He switched parties when he thought the Democrats were a little soft on slavery. <laughs> he's, uh, no, he's. <laughs> He's a tremendous fundraiser, but then again, so is Jerry Lewis. <laughs> now, he's got to be tough. He has got to prove he's tough on all those issues like poverty and uh, welfare and affirmative, affirmative action, immigration. He's so tough on immigration, he just had his wife deported. I mean, that is really... Boy, they let you know when you step over the line here, don't they, sir? It's just, they don't screw around about that. It's just, it's either a big laugh or ooh. All right, that's another ooh. No, it just seems like a uh, conservative is in, and that's okay. I mean, a lot of people want to be conservative. It just seems that we've lost a little balance. I think that, like in 10 years, the word liberal is going to be synonymous with the word gay. People will go, you know, I I'm a liberal. Oh, really? Maybe you should meet my friend Bob. <laughs> He's a liberal. I mean, I know they want to shrink the government. I know they want balanced budget amendment and term limits. Why not just have a government of temps? <laughs> Kelly girls who come in, we could shrink the government, have it so it could fit in the size of a professional building. A dentist, a key maker, U.S. government. Where's Bob Dornan? I love Bob Dornan. He was on our show. It's hard to give right-wing nutcases a bad name, but... <laughs> I'd like to quote him, but everything he ever said was stricken from the record. <laughs> Who else is uh, running for president? Uh, Dick Luger? What is it with the Republican names, by the way? Dick Luger, it sounds like something Jocelyn Elders wants to teach school kids about. <sighs> don't write that one down. I don't think you're gonna be able to use that one. No, I mean... <sighs> I, I was sitting next to the... Uh, the uh, Oh, Christ, I don't know your job, but I know it's an important one, Mr. Army, but <laughs> it's... <laughs> oh, order. It's, uh... Bill, what is his job? Majority leader. Oh, Christ. <sighs> I don't know. I just think if your name is Dick Army, maybe making a fag joke's a little redundant. You know what I'm saying? <laughs> tells me I'm gonna get wrestled to the ground before I leave. <laughs> but, uh, no, we won't call them Richard Luger. How about that? But Luger itself is confusing. With a name like Luger, he's liable to get most of the neo-Nazi vote, which would be a big blow to Pat Buchanan. <laughs> Pat Buchanan, he's been an outsider here longer than Doris Day has been a virgin. Well, let's talk about the Democrats for a while, shall we? <laughs> I would, but I feel sorry for them. Now, even Jesse Jackson says that he may challenge the president this year, absolutely. He says the president has not been strong enough on poverty or affirmative action, and he almost never makes something rhyme. So, <laughs> I... Now, I have no idea why the Democratic platform of higher taxes and more lesbians in government was not a big hit in November of 94. It's tough when you have to present these programs and they get scaled back. Healthcare, first they wanted universal coverage, now they're just trying to get a price freeze on Doan's pills. I mean, 
How many of you saw a couple of uh, weeks ago when the three uh, presidents were playing golf? President, uh, ex-president Ford and ex-president Bush. Bush hit, hit a woman, and, uh, but he felt bad. He went over, he said, look, if it'll make you feel any better, I'll throw up on you. You know, just, <laughs> which was nice. But uh, <laughs> after the game, they asked them their scores, you know, and uh, Ford guessed, uh, Bush lied, and Clinton said he'd have to think about it. I thought that would be big, quite frankly. <laughs> but, I mean, if you look at those three men, you realize, aside from the job, we elect really nice people. I mean, if they weren't in this crappy job, they'd be among the most, I mean, Bill, is there, I mean, Mr. President. <laughs> There's nobody you couldn't win over on a personal level. I mean, that's a nice thing about this country. We elect nice guys. Of course, we need a great man, too, and there is a difference. I mean, General George S. Patton, was a great man, defeated the Nazis. Dick Van Patten is a nice guy. <laughs> you wouldn't switch their jobs. Fortunately, we have a president who's a nice guy and a great man. And, and I have a hat for you, sir. <laughs> well, anyway, I think a lot of people always mention politicians. They all always mention the press as having a problem with those two groups but they don't mention the people. They forget the fact that the people are also full of it a lot of the times. The people. They always say they want straight talk from the politicians, but they don't. Paul Songus ran for president under the slogan, I'm not Santa Claus, and he's not president either. <laughs> Santa Claus is someone who could actually win. He'd be the perfect candidate. He comes around once a year, everything's for free. Santa Claus could be president. Uh, provided he'd performed fewer than 12 abortions. <laughs> what is it with the Surgeon General, by the way? My God, they make such a big deal about it, and it's just, it's kind of like your mother. You know, he just tells you don't smoke, stop being fat, eat your peas. <laughs> they wear a sailor suit. I mean, I don't know what the big fuss is about. <laughs> Only you people think to think it's important. Besides the fact, if you, let, if you let people do what Jocelyn Elder suggested, you wouldn't have to let Henry Foster do what he wanted to do. <laughs> well, it's tough having an economic policy, I know, but the people don't seem to want to hear the truth. Remember, in the 80s, we said they could cut taxes, raise defense spending, and balance the budget. And George Bush himself said that's voodoo economics, and everybody went, voodoo economics? Let's give it a try. <laughs> I mean, the name of the plan was actually trickle-down economics, trickle-down. They're actually saying, we're pissing on you. <laughs> How much closer can you get? I mean, people really don't want to see the truth. You know what's proof of that? Are you following the OJ trial? Probably. The lawyers in that trial are amazing. They say there's not a shred of evidence. That's what Robert Shapiro said. Really? OJ Simpson, I mean, he beat his ex-wife, he beat his first wife, he beat his girlfriend, he even beat the Wiz. I mean, nobody beats the Wiz, ladies and gentlemen. <laughs> I mean, not a shred of evidence. There's a bloody glove at the house. There's a bloody glove at the crime scene. It's, it's like a two-minute Columbo episode. <laughs> this guy did everything but leave a business card. <laughs> and now a lot of the ratings for the shows that he's on go up. I mean, they can't help it. Everybody's trying to compete. In fact, now on, on Regis, he bitch slaps Kathy Lee every morning. It's really ridiculous. Well, you can't deny the fact that show business and politics have effectively merged in this country. Barbara Streisand, look at how many times she's been here. And did you hear this? She's gonna get a doctorate degree from Brandeis. Can you imagine that? Barbara Streisand, a doctor? Boy, you think you waited a long time to see her as a singer. <laughs> Is uh, Ben Nighthorse Campbell here? Interesting, he switched parties last week and uh, it was an interesting thing. The next day, the Republicans had a lunch to, to honor him, and to do so, they wore that bolo tie. Yeah, to honor him. And then the next day, to really honor him, they, they got liquored up and stole his land.
I tell you. He switched parties, but uh, a lot of politicians would switch parties if they could get their good side on C-SPAN. No, it's all, pol I mean, this year they added a new camera angle to the State of the Union address. Did you notice that from behind? I, and I never realized, realized it before, but uh, Al Gore has a pretty nice ass. <laughs> and you know, I, I am not one of those people, those naysayers who say the speech was too long, uh-uh. But next time, maybe cut out the drum solo. That's all I'm saying. <laughs> I mean, <laughs> he went through the New Covenant and half of the Old Testament <laughs> and a part of the Celestine prophecy. Where is Helen Thomas when you need her? No, I can't. No, but show business, it's true. It's all over the world show business takes over politics. Look at, in Iran, did you follow this story? In Iran, they had to take down the satellite dishes because the Iranian version of America's, you know, uh, Iranian, oh, fuck it. But, um, <laughs> there was one in there, but I tell you, it was just too hard to get out. And we will strike that from the record. But that is another reason why it's probably very tough to be president. You've got you've to deal with foreign leaders all the time. I read today that Bar Boris Yeltsin just changed his position. Uh, he was slumped over, now he's prone. <laughs> and like, like the French, a couple of weeks ago, they caught us spying. Did you see that story? There was Americans over there, and the French said they were spying on them. They said they caught them because they spoke perfect French, but they caught them. They were saying please and thank you. <laughs> yeah, they put them in solitary. They're at Euro Disney. But uh, all right, let's conclude with talking about some of the people who, who are not going to run for president. The, the speaker is not going to run. He said he needs to spend a little more time with his ego. Uh, <laughs> now, he's been very good news for my industry of show business because uh, for every time there's a problem, uh, he suggests a movie. It's great for blockbusters. No, there was a you know, Boys Town for the orphans and the baseball strike, uh, Field of Dreams, and uh, for the homeless, Breakfast at Tiffany's. I mean, there's always... <laughs> no, that made big news when the speaker suggested Boys Town. And, and I rented Boys Town. Of course, I rented it in Greenwich Village. I don't think it's the same movie that he was talking about. <laughs> Is the village people in this one that you know, that's a whole different thing, isn't it? No, he has amazing ideas, this speaker. He said last week that, that kids should get two dollars for every book they read, and three for every one they burn. So, I mean, it's an amazing policy. Oh, I knew that was going to get booed, but... He said, uh, when he first got the job, he said a quarter of the administration here presently was on drugs, which is what we call the contract with South America. Uh, <laughs> And they had a big fight over the minimum wage. Mr. Gingrich was against it. He said, if poor people need more money, let them get their own book deal. <laughs> and then they had a fundraiser, $50,000 a plate. 50,000, and it was soup or salad. I mean, that's what pissed me off. <laughs> Who else is not? Strom Thurmond, I don't see. He is amazing. He was at the uh, Vietnam Memorial the other day. He said, Mr. Gorbachev, tear down this wall. <laughs> He's losing it, I'm telling you. They... <laughs> no, uh... <laughs> A lot of the Republicans have uh, asked him to step down, but the last time he did, he broke his hip. You know, it's... He says he won't, he won't step down. It's, it's part of his cataract with America. <laughs> now, he's a little behind the times as far as ethnic sensitivity goes. In fact, a couple of years ago, you may remember the, uh, the movie Birth of a Nation was out and it got pulled, yeah, because people didn't like it from the theaters. And, uh, and Strom protested. He said, it's not fair. They're, they're not writing any good parts for Klansmen anymore. Well, I guess you'll get it on the way home, but... Um, 
No, he's against some of the more radical bills that are in the Senate right now, like the uh, Emancipation Proclamation. Yeah, he's got his own version of history. He said at the Gettysburg Address, what happened was that they, they loaded the wrong envelope into the teleprompter. <laughs> I thought they knew history. All right, well, how about Dan Quayle? He's not running. Yeah, poor Dan Quayle. That's, when he said he wasn't going to run, that was bad for comics. That was Black Tuesday. I feel sorry for him. He's, he's got all the medical problems of the elder statesman without any other respect. All right, well, I think I've probably used up just about enough of your time. No, uh, that's okay. Now, Dan Quayle said he's thinking about running in the gubernatorial race in Indiana, but he's, he's got to take time to think about it. He's not sure whether he wants to be a goober. Yeah, I, I thought it was interesting. He made his first speech the other day at an Amway convention, they, and people said, why Amway? He said, well, because our nation's rail service is important. <laughs> Dick Cheney, there's another guy who's not going to run. He was going to run, said he's not. What happened is that he, Dick Cheney did some research, and he found out that the press was probably going to dig deeply into his personal life and find nothing. I mean, it's tough when the poll results come back and everybody thinks you were the second Darren on Bewitched. <laughs> Listen, folks, thank you very much. I appreciate your patronage. It's been a pleasure speaking to you, and thank you for inviting me down here. Have a good night. Thank you. Thank you very much. Bill, thank you uh, very, very much. <clears throat> Before we uh, begin the uh, concluding remarks, there is one more item. Jamie Bragg of WTOP Radio has recently retired after 38 years on the air. Jamie is suffering from prostate cancer. He's not here tonight, but his colleagues at WTOP have asked me to recognize Jamie, express their fondness and respect and let him know that their best wishes and their prayers are with him. I'm sure that we all join in those sentiments. <clears throat> when I made the uh, concluding remarks at last year's dinner, I paid tribute to Tina Tate, director of the House Radio Television Gallery, and her staff, and to Larry Janzik, director of the Senate Radio Television Gallery, and his staff. These good people successfully navigate a difficult course. They work for the Senate and the House, and they work for us. I know from two years on the Executive Committee how well they serve us, and I know that they have the respect and confidence of their congressional bosses as well. Heartfelt thanks to Larry Janzik and his Senate Gallery staff, Jane Rule, Diane Lane, Eric LeBlanc, Gloria Halcom, Garrett Paulin, and John Benison. And to Tina Tate and her house gallery staff, Katie Cullen, Beverly Braun, Gail Davis, Olga Ramirez, Chris Hill, and Denise Painter. Please join me in applauding our good work. One more important recognition. A dinner like this does not just happen. It takes a year of hard work. Most of that hard work is done by a delightful and talented woman, Ivan Goldberg of Barbara Boggs Associates. Ivan, thank you and God bless you. <clears throat> and now my last official duty, the former <clears throat> formal introduction of the current President of the Radio Television Correspondents Association and Chairman of the Executive Committee, Keenan Block of McNeil Lair. In, uh, in many ways, Keenan and Joan Barone are soulmates. Keenan, too, is a man of great intelligence, uncommon decency, and absolute journalistic integrity. As well, he is a man of great talent, energy, and enthusiasm. I leave you in excellent hands, Keenan.
Thank you. I, I just I want to thank Bill for those incredibly kind words and just say that I feel very honored and the executive committee has been very lucky to have Bill this past year as our chairman. Bill has a wisdom, a patience, and most important of all, a terrific sense of humor that has served us all well. And I just want to thank you, Bill. And before we officially adjourn, just a, a reminder, please stay seated until the President and First Lady leave the hall. Thank you all very much for joining us tonight. This officially concludes the dinner tonight.